There. We're live! <laughs> and next Swift joined. Well, thank goodness I have one viewer. Hi! <laughs> I am apolog Let me apologize for being late. Uh, there was a little bit of connection problems just then. Uh, also, my other class went late because of the whole thing. Let's just say technology has been uh, not my best friend today. So, um... <laughs> oh, nice. Hi, John Green. Who else is on? Oh, nice. So hi, everybody. Um, this is, uh, I don't know if this is your first time seeing me or if you've done these before, but... Uh, you see what you heard. No. <laughs> you mean apologize. <laughs> oh, wait, who said apologize? John, <laughs> John, that's great. Apologize. Nice. Well done. Uh, this, if you, I don't know if you've joined one of these before. Uh, this is a daily live cast I've been doing. Um, normally... If you can see some of the previous episodes I've done on my uh, YouTube channel, George Olympians, normally I will come at you with some sort of uh, prepared lecture. It doesn't seem super prepared. I have some notes and things. I have some ideas of what I'm saying. Today, I don't have that. Today's been a cuckoo bananas day. I walked, I think it was 300 miles to my studio to get some art supplies. I just taught a class at Word Bookstores, and now this. So I'm just today, I'm here to answer your questions and give you some answers. So if anybody out there has some questions, I have my, my handy dandy drawing board. I'm gonna be doing some pictures if I need to illustrate a point. But anybody who has questions, oh, we have some questions from the other day. Let's start answering some of these questions that we've been having so many responses, which is amazing and awesome. I haven't had a chance to answer them all. So, why did the gods overthrow the Titans? The first question is why did the gods overthrow the Titans? And uh, well, it's a little bit of a sense of self-preservation. So I don't know how familiar you all are with Greek mythology, but in Greek mythology, there's been multiple generations of gods. First god was Gaia. She creates Uranus, the sky, takes him as her husband, and he that's like the first generation of gods. They have a bunch of kids, the Cyclo Cyclopes, the Hecatonchires, and most importantly, the Titans. And then the Titans overthrow Uranus, and they become the new gods. And so then the Titans start having their kids, and one of the kids, well, specifically Kronos and Rhea, two Titans come together, their kids are the first generation of Olympians. And at this point, Kronos the Titan, he already understands. He sees this pattern. He's like, I overthrew my dad. And he looks at these kids. He's like, these kids are probably going to overthrow me. And being king of everything is pretty sweet. So he starts eating his kids. It's not cool. It's very hard to justify. It's just not a cool move. So he swallows them. They're gods. They're immortal. You can't kill them. They just live inside his belly. So he swallows Hestia. He swallows Hades. He swallows Demeter. He swallows Poseidon. He swallows Hera. And then he swallows a rock. He thinks it's Zeus. The reason why the gods overthrow them, Zeus is raised in secret, and he's like kind of like the Trojan rock, I guess. He doesn't, Kronos doesn't realize he didn't actually swallow him. Zeus works with Mother Earth to overthrow the Titans. And the reason that the gods overthrew the Titans is because half of the gods were in his belly. So first Zeus accident, well, doesn't accidentally, feeds him something that makes him throw up all the other kids. There's a big mess, all these other gods come out. And they wage this battle for like 11 years across the surface of the Earth, destroy almost the entire planet, Tris trying to like overthrow these Titans, and they finally do. So that's this long and short of it. There's, it's, it's the reason they did it was because... I mean, they were being eaten otherwise, you know? I think they're pretty justified in the fighting back. Someone says, we have to know about that Lego set from your Insta. Did you oh. create them yourself? Okay. So in my uh, advertisement for today, I showed uh, my Lego Olympian set. And somebody wrote, we have to know about it. And uh, guys, I'm really sorry. My original plan today, I was going to give you a guided tour of Lego Olympus but uh, the internet is so bad at my house that I'm actually at my girlfriend's house because her internet's better and I don't have the Lego Olympians here. But I will tell you about the Lego Olympians. The Lego Olympians is actually probably the best gift I've ever received. It started as something my girlfriend got me. She made it herself. She went into my books. Well, she didn't like literally crawl inside them like Gumby or something. She looked at my books and then she like through 
searching tons of individual Lego minifigure pieces, she constructed not the entirety of Lego Olympus. I think there's like got to be like 20 something characters up there, maybe more. Probably about like 11 to start off with. Did your books. You did for each of the books? You didn't have Dionysus, but he wasn't in his book yet, yeah. Hestia. So, uh, yeah, but did have Hestia, yes. So there was like 12 of them and gave this to me. It was like, oh my gosh. So she and I have worked on this thing now for years where we kind of upgrade different gods and we bring in other gods. So now it's pretty much like if you've ever seen my Olympians poster, I have a Lego figure for almost every single character on the poster. And then I also made this base of Mount Olympus. Now what you saw on my, on my Instagram, it's just like the top. It's like their little palace. There used to be an entire Lego built mountain I made. It was enormous. The thing was like this big. And I have cats. And it was on, and the cats just like, okay, I'm going to have to give you guys a tour when my internet's better. Because I have, you come to my house, I have a giant, it's called Bricklin. It's a whole Lego city. And above it, on the wall, was mounted Lego Olympus. And it was like the gods raised above Brick, Bricklin. It was great. But my awful evil cats literally knocked Olympus onto Bricklin. There was so much carnage. It was Olympus has fallen and the mountain was shattered and buildings were destroyed and there were gods everywhere. Like we couldn't find Aphrodite for like a week. She was like in the radiator. It was just, it was awful. But I will, um, I do plan because I'm very proud of Lego Olympus. I want to give, uh, and the Lego Olympians, to give a proper tour of them one of these days. What are your thoughts on power of the gods being sourced by belief from mortals, more specifically having a following? Oh, okay. So this is a question. It, um, I think I actually talked about this one time before, but it bears repeating. What do I think about the idea that the power of the gods is somehow sourced from mortals? Like they actually gain their abilities from belief in mortals. And as near as I can tell, and I could be mistaken, this is not actually an idea that originates a myth anywhere. I think this is something that is um, a construct of more modern authors writing about the gods, especially in the modern day. Um, it reflects an idea. I don't think I don't think the gods had a symbiotic relationship. The Greek idea of the gods is really like you see it like like in Plato's writings. He writes specifically. He's like, oh, the gods exist. That much is true, but they don't have anything to do with us. Because that's how he explained how bad things still happen to good people. It's like, but I made all these sacrifices. Why did my leg fall off? Because the gods are just different. They're away. So. I like that as a as a as a construct for modern stuff, but then it, it it would kind of mean like nowadays, even though the Olympians have many fans, they don't have a, a lot of believers necessarily, so that would mean they were like super not powerful nowadays, and I like the I like the idea of the remote detached gods, like they're out there, they're still insanely powerful, they can do whatever they want, but they act like people, which makes them fun. Um, but yeah, I, I don't view them as having a dependency on people, but that's my personal beliefs. And like I said, I don't think mythologically they believe that either or religiously back in the day. If Zeus, for whatever reason, were to lose his throne, who would rule Olympus? Would there be a power struggle for the throne? Ooh, if Zeus, for whatever reason, were to lose his throne, who would rule Olympus or would there be a power struggle? So... I've mentioned it a few times before. It's even featured in my book, um, Poseidon. There is a myth that survives to us, though we don't have the complete myth. It's a bit of it. Where um, Zeus is overthrown, albeit briefly, by a triumvirate of Hera, Poseidon, and Athena. And that makes a lot of sense that those would be the three that would actually do the overthrowing. Um, Athena was actually fated to overthrow Zeus before he bent fate, the only god to ever do so, swallowed her mother. So Athena grew up inside of his brain. He swallows Metis. She gives birth inside of his head. And then Athena grows up inside of Zeus's brain. And that understanding him that well changes her. She no longer wants to overthrow him, although she clearly did at least once. Um, Hera is his, you know, his long suffering queen. She's an equal of his in power, but she has to put up with a lot. And I feel like she's the one who really gets stuff work done, like the actual day to day ruling. Cause Zeus is always running around like, Oh, that lady looks pretty. Let me chase her around. And Poseidon of course has super duper issues with his brother. It's his little brother and his little brother's the king of the universe. He's like, why? So 
those three make some sense for it, but there's also, um, I'm going to throw in a really weird one who I think might be. And it's not just because I'm working on his book right now, but um, there's some evidence from certain branches of Greek, ancient Greek religion that Dionysus was going to take over, that he was the next step. And it's very interesting when you look at the way the gods' generations are. So I'm glad we had that first question. First generation, Gaia and Uranos. They're not human, humanized at all. They're not personified. She's literally the planet Earth. He's literally the sky. They give birth to the second generation, the Titans, right? And the Titans are like these huge, colossal, towering figures. They're vaguely humanoid, but they're definitely not human-shaped. Then they give birth to the next generation, the Olympians. Olympians are immortal, undying. They can change shape. They still take these gorgeous human forms. Dionysus is like the next step in that evolution. All the other Olympians are either weirdly self-created, like Aphrodite, or they have two divine parents. Both their parents were deities of some sort. Poseid I'm Dionysus, his dad is Zeus, but his mom is the mortal princess Semele. So he's kind of like, he's the son of a god. He's like a demigod, but he ascends to this highest level. And I think it makes a lot of sense that as like things were progressing and the idea of gods and the idea of religions changed, the idea of the son of God, born of mortal woman, that's, a, that's an idea we've probably heard some other places. I feel like Dionysus was the one that would have taken over, which is weird because, like, I mean, imagine him as the head god. He's like, all right, today's the day we drink. That was the same day as yesterday, Dionysus. Every day is. <laughs> Speaking of Dionysus, can, Ooh. We, can we pretty please get a general release date for Dionysus? Oh, my gosh. So the uh, speaking of Dionysus, can we please get a general release release date? I'm going to get back to you on that. I have an email with it somewhere. I forgot what it is. I don't want to give out information. Probably next fall. It's probably next fall, I'm being told. That's probably about right. I know. It's been a while. I took time off to do a book for adults called Unrig. It's coming out in July in between. It was like 200-something pages. It was a lot of work. Um, the good news is Dionysus, I'm very happy with. It's going to be... Like, it's going to tie up almost every single odds and end in there, and it's going to be followed rapidly thereafter by the four books in the Asgardian series. So you're going to have, like, more George O'Connor coming at you than you know what to do with very shortly. Who do you think really punished Pirithous? Pirithous? Hades or Persephone? P-I-R-I-T-H-O-U-S. Oh, no. I'm totally blanking on who that is. So who do I think really punished Pirithous, Hades, or Persephone? I'm blanking on who that is. Like, it makes me think of Mentha, which I think Pirithous is actually one of the... There's two extramarital loves for Hades. Am I wrong about this? I don't know. I don't know who that is right now. I am very sorry. Whoever that is, get back to me on that one, and I'll form an opinion very quickly. Do you have any comments on the artistic evolution of the series with the characters' designs? Oh, wow. That's an interesting question. Do I have any comments on the uh, artistic evolution of the series in regards to like the characters' designs? I, uh, I actually often wonder if people notice that there has been a, a thing, but I guess at least some of you have. Because I've been working on the series for about 10 years now. And uh, when your job is drawing and you draw every day over 10 years, things do change. And I look at like stuff in Zeus. When I drew the first book, um, my style was, um, I'll get super nerdy here. I was being very influenced by an artist named Mike Mignola at the time. So I had a lot of these kind of like flat black shapes and things in there. And eventually as I drew more, I, I didn't like those flat black shapes as much. And if you look at like, um, Hephaestus, the most recently drawn one, um, it's, it's getting a little bit grittier looking. And one of the reasons I want to do Asgardians is like everything is very clean cut looking in Zeus. And by Hephaestus, I'm really having fun drawing like the more gritty stuff. Another super gritty thing is uh, the drawings of Typhon in the book Hermes, where he's got like all this like kind of grainy texture throughout him. I'm really enjoying drawing that sort of stuff. I think also in a lot of ways, just because it's my job and hopefully I'll always get better, I think I draw better. There's some panels in Zeus I look at, I'm just like, mm. but like, what do you do? I mean, that's just the thing. Every once in a while, there's one panel in Zeus that is maybe the best thing I've ever drawn. And I'm, I don't know why it looks so good. I'll never draw it again. It's Zeus. It's silent panel. It's him. It's during the big fight against the Titans. 
It's a wordless panel. It's him riding a lightning bolt down. He's got it above his head and he lands. And it's just like, I'm like, that's cool. And I don't know. I don't think I could draw that now. So sometimes your stuff changes. Um, I feel like the designs of the characters don't change that much. There's been a few things, um, particularly colors. I didn't know how some of the colors would mix. So you notice some character skin tones have changed a bit. Like specifically Aphrodite was much lighter because she just didn't, I didn't mix the colors right for the printer. And like, I think like Apollo is darker. Like they're, the colors change and things like that have changed. But for the most part, the designs are, I'm working the same idea. Things just as you draw them over and over again, they get more simplified. What would you say to an uninvited, devoted follower of the gods who were to enter Mount Olympus? Like, how would the gods react? Oh, wow. Well... <clears throat> uninvited, but devoted. Uninvited, but devoted. Um, the one story I could think to set a mythological precedence for this would be the story of Bellerophon. Um, a lot of people... Uh, Bellerophon's a hero that's been really shorted by modern tellings. He is the hero that tamed Pegasus and rode uh, him, Pegasus. Um, and in the Disney movie, that's Hercules' horse. In Clash of the Titans, it's Perseus's, but it was Bellerophon. And Bellerophon did believe in the gods. And he, upon achieving flight with um, Pegasus, he decides to fly to Olympus and announce, like, hey, welcome me. Here I'm the great hero Bellerophon, tame the winged steed Pegasus, and here I am. And Zeus blows him up with a lightning bolt. And so... I feel like that's what would happen. So, I, I mean, here's the thing. Let's tie this in with the idea, like, do the gods really care if we worship them so much? Probably not. So I could, like, imagine, like, somehow I get up to Olympus and, like, I pass through the dimensional membrane. So I'm not just on top of a medium-sized mountain. I'm, like, actually in the realm of the gods. I'm like, oh, man, guys, I've made all these books about you and I talk about you all the time and I love you so much. And, hey, what? Boom. And I'm just ash. I think that's what would happen. And I deserve it. If the gods don't care if we worship them, then why did Zeus get mad when he lightning bolted all the good fat? That's a good question. If the gods don't care that we worship them, what was the whole deal with the whole trick at Mikoni that I talked about in the uh, Prometheus episode? Where, like, why are there sacrifices made to the gods? There's actually a myth that explains why there's sacrifices made to the gods. Not surprisingly, it starts with Hermes. When Hermes was a baby, his first, you know, he's born, he's already like the smartest guy, but he's so smart he decides to hide the fact he's a smart baby because that's weird. So he steals his brother's cows, Apollo's, and he makes the first sacrifice. He kills two of the cows and he it's awesome, the hubris of this, like the, the cheek of this little baby. He kills two cows and he makes it as a sacrifice to the 12 great gods. And if you think about it, there weren't 12 Olympians yet. He counts himself as one of them. He's like, yeah, because I know. So he starts this precedent. So I feel like it's probably a deal that Hermes started, and he probably put the idea, he's like, Hermes is the god who deals the most with the humans, except for Hestia. Hestia is a much nicer figure. Hermes, he's a bit of a wheeler dealer. He's the god of liars, businessmen, politicians. He's like... Hey, Pop, there's a lot of these guys. They do some cool stuff. I think what we need to do is we need to make them sure that they keep us in mind as the bosses and they need to make sacrifices to us. And although I don't think Zeus really does care all that much, he doesn't do a lot to make sure they keep worshiping him. It's not like he, like, you know, solves great miracles in their behavior. I think it's just, you know, he's a guy who's used to just having people be like, oh, mighty Zeus. But at the end of the day, that is, I think he just wanted what was best for him because he's just selfish. I don't know. I think we know people like that. I think we can think of leaders who do stuff like that. Uh, does Artemis or Apollo ever compete with Eros for who shoots best? <laughs> oh, wow. I, it, somebody asked, is there a myth where Artemis, Apollo, and Eros ever have like a, a contest to see who's the best archer? I would be stunned if it wasn't Artemis. I'll just say that. Like, You know, Apollo, he's also far shooting Apollo. They're twins. It's very tempting to like kind of like match their uh abilities up with it but like he's doing other stuff like artemis all she does is shoot arrows that's kind of her thing right so i feel like she's but then also they're gods they can just like how does he miss a target it should be like hawkeye like i can't even miss if i want to just like looks the other way but i feel like she would be the best i feel like eros he uses the bow and arrow but his main intention is not really about the bow and arrow i think his main intention is about causing trouble 
So I feel like he's just not going to be on the same level. Art. Also, he's just not in terms of just sheer power. The other ones are Olympians. Eros is like Olympians adjacent. He's kind of like, I think everyone would be rather he wasn't around, but he's with Aphrodite and she's definitely there. So like, okay, bring your weird baby around here that shoots everybody. Okay. So we got clarity. Uh, clarification. Pirithos. Pirithios, I'd say. Pirithios was the one that went with Theseus to the underworld. Oh, of course! Yes! Marry her. All right. Thank you. I do know this story. This is actually a fun story that I did want to include in. So Pirithios is a hero of Theseus. I've made clear my, a friend of Theseus, I've made clear my feelings about Theseus. He's not my favorite hero. Pirithios was like, I have a crush on Persephone. I'm going to go down to the underworld and make her my bride. And Theseus is like, really? He's like, yes. So they make this trek down to the underworld. It's part of the big hero's journey to make a journey to the underworld. Almost all these significant heroes do a trip like this. Zeus does it. Heracles does it. And so this is Theseus's one. And so they go there and they, uh, they somehow they get down to the underworld. And they're like, we're here to take your wife, Hades. And Hades is like, okay, that's interesting. Why don't you take a seat here and we'll discuss this like gentlemen. Like, we will. And he sits down and they're stuck. And they're stuck for like ever. And he's like, okay, see you guys later. And then they're just kind of left there to stay, think about how bad a move this was. Eventually... Heracles, when he makes his trip down to there, he finds the two of them stuck to the bench. And he's like, hey, why are you guys sitting there on that bench? And it must have been terrible. They must have peed on themselves by then so many times. And he's like, they're like, well, we tried to like carry off Persephone and Hades told us to sit here and we thought that wasn't a good move. And he's like, well, let me see if I can pull you up. He grabs Theseus hard as he can and pulls and pulls and pulls and rips Theseus up. Most of Theseus' butt and thighs stick on there still. And apparently, Athenians had very thin butts. And this was really the myth to explain why Athenians don't have good butts. Because Theseus, who was the Athenian hero, he left his butt there. Pirithius stuck. He can't get him up, no matter how hard Heracles, a guy who can literally lift the atmosphere of the entire planet over his head, can't pull this guy up. So to break, just to fill in that story... Definitely Hades did that. Of course. I don't think Persephone probably was... Because Persephone... I don't know. I feel like she didn't have to be made aware of this one. I think she was like, hey, what's with that room over there? And Hades like, don't we worry about that room. Like she's, But I always hear guys crying in there. She's like, yeah, yeah, don't worry. I think that was definitely Hades doing that. It's a fun story. I actually... You know, I, this is like a, an Olympian's lost hit. I did uh, for one of those... Um, what, what is that series called? The Recess Books... Comic Squad. Comic Squad. I actually did a Comic Squad story that was a Greek myth one. It wasn't Olympians, but it was like kind of kids' versions of characters. And Pyrtheus is in there, and he, it's, like, it's actually in detention, and he's stuck to the bench outside there. So I've actually kind of touched the story, just not in Olympians. I'll have to post some information about that so you guys can find that one, because it was a story I had a lot of fun writing. Do you think being rescued by Dionysus after Theseus abandoned her was an upgrade for Ariadne? So the question was, was being rescued by um, Dionysus after she was abandoned on Naxos by um, uh, Theseus, was that an upgrade? Yeah, yeah, of course. Theseus is a creep. So really quickly, backstory. Ariadne was a princess of the Minoan, of, well, she was literally the daughter of King Minos, who we like name the Minoan culture after. And she is a sister, half-sister of the Minotaur. And this young, strapping Athenian prince who's really good-looking, but it just rotten to the core, Theseus, she doesn't know yet, comes up. And she's like, well, he's very handsome, and he has the bearing of a god. I think I'll help him. And so she gives him, like, the, the uh, string so he can get himself out of, his, out of the labyrinth. He goes in. He kills the Minotaur. I've talked about the Minotaur. I don't think the Minotaur is that bad. That's a future episode. We'll do the Minotaur. Uh, he carries her, uh, off. Well, then, well, he gets out and she's like, well, I can't stay here. I just, I literally just betrayed my father to help you. He's like, oh, I guess you could come with me. And they sail off for Athens and they stop off at the island of Naxos just to like, you know, replenish. And then he just leaves her there until he forgets. Theseus is the worst. He's the worst hero. He's a jerk. He's a total jerk. So she's standing there just on the shore, just like, wait, what, really? Just left me on this uninhabited island? And she's there for some amount of time. We don't know how long. 
And then one day she hears music off in the background and she sees these torches bobbing along this path. And all of a sudden there's just this entourage that you've never seen before of satyrs and maniads and just like all these like leopards and whatever Salinas is, all these dudes. And then there's Dionysus. And this is a scene that's in my Dionysus book. And it's one of the things I'm really happy I wrote because they have a real meat cute moment. And she goes from like super creepy, like he's good looking, but like kind of rotten to the core, Hero Theseus. And then she goes to like, Hi, I'm about to become an Olympian and I love to have a good time, Dionysus. Yeah, total upgrade. Definitely. If you ever get a chance where you're stuck having to date Theseus or <laughs> Dionysus, man, go for Dionysus. He's much more fun. Do you think it's more punishing to hold up the sky or be stuck in Tartarus? Oh, we get a lot of variations on this question. I think we have some real Titan fanatics here. Is it more punishing to be stuck in Tartarus, down so deep under the ground that you never see the sun, trapped behind bars of adamantine? Or is it more punishing to be up on the surface of the earth, but have to hold up the entire atmosphere, the entire sky? And of course, that was Atlas the Titan's punishment, and the rest of the Titans were stuck underground in the darkness. And I, I, I feel like I may be vacillated on this, but I feel like it's worse to be underground because the air is really stale and you don't see the sun and there's just nothing to do. And even though he's constantly exerting himself, Atlas, he's least out in the open and we know that he gets visitors. He meets Heracles he sometimes, and there's a myth where he meets Perseus and he gets turned to stone, but that doesn't make sense because Perseus is the grandfather of Heracles, so he couldn't met Heracles later and that's too important, the Heracles story. But he, his daughters come to visit him. He gets visitors. He's just constantly holding stuff it's just you know it's a great exertion but he is he's a titan he's immortal he's timeless he he doesn't get tired the same we do same way we do like you if i had to hold the sky up for even one second i'd be flattened in a moment but for him it's probably not as bad so i think he's got the better of the two punishments getting a request to ask if you can draw atlas i should draw atlas <clears throat> so whenever i draw the titans um, I think I've actually said this on this show before, but the Titans, uh, the color I draw them, it's to be reminiscent of Greek vase art. I sh just like I was talking about, like there's the evolution of different uh, generations of gods. I kind of wanted to show the evolution of art. And the Greek vase art is something that's like kind of a little bit more um, abstracted. You know, the, the figures came before. They don't have that incredible lifelike that the Hellenistic art period does, where, like, when we think of Greek statues, they're amazing. It's like, it's almost like Medusa looked at them and turned them into marble. The gods are marble. The titans are vase paintings. So when I draw Atlas, Atlas, I spoke about him briefly on the Prometheus episode. He and Prometheus are both second generation Titans. The thing that's different is Prometheus kind of really looks like a person, but Atlas truly has the Titanic proportions of the first generations. So Prometheus, I mean, he'd be pretty big if we were standing next to him. He's probably about like, you know, I draw him about maybe 10 feet tall, which is huge. You see a 10 foot tall guy, you're like, that's the biggest guy I've ever seen. But he's like, a thousand feet tall. He's enormous. And I draw him in this position. I think a lot of people, I'm not sure when it became the idea that he holds up the globe, but if he's holding up the earth, what's he standing on, right? He's actually, he's holding up like the sky, like the atmosphere itself, like the actual like tattered almost the sky. So he's like, the trick of drawing him is you have to draw him like he's like under this great weight, but he's, he's, it's almost like he's doing like that thing mimes do, where he's kind of standing in a, an invisible box. I'm not gonna draw any details, but all the Titans, when I draw them, they don't have clothes on. Who makes clothes that big? I've never established if they have anything dirty that you would have to see there, but let's just put his leg there. I'm doing a lot of shadow on him because the titans are often in like this dark shadow. Again, they're colored in this like rich earthen color to show like that vase painting style I was talking about. And then let's just draw the hints of mountains around him. 
There is a story that doesn't work out chronologically, I mentioned briefly, where eventually Perseus visits him. And he's, it's when Perseus has the um, head of Medusa severed, and he shows it to Atlas and turns him into a mountain. And that was an explanation for a mountain called the Atlas Mountains. Um, but it doesn't work because Atlas plays a really important part. Like I said, in Heracles' story, um, he's the one who gets the apples of the Hesperides for him. Heracles couldn't have done that. Oh, there we go. So, and it's just a story. I also don't think, I don't think that a Titan could get killed by Medusa, personally. That's just my feeling. They're immortal. If a god, an Olympian can't, we know they can't, I don't see why he would. Let me turn this a little bit more towards you. Oh, I broke it. This is the perils of live casting. So how's that? Pretty cool? I think it's pretty cool. Do we get any questions while I was drawn? Um, so you write such strong women with agency. If you could change any story about a goddess, what would it be? Hmm. Well, thank you very much. The uh, question was, you write such strong women with agency. If you could write any, change any story about a goddess, what would it be? That's interesting. That's a really good question. Thank you very much for that. It's something I try to do. Um, it bothers me when stories don't. Like, I famously talk about, well, I, I'm not famous, but I talk about it in the story of Hades. Um, we never learn, like, in the original versions, we never learn about what Persephone's thinking. And that's something I'm like, I, I want to know Persephone's side of that story. There wouldn't be a story without Persephone. So, I mean, that's one I did. I did cast a light on her. Um, a lot of the stories I, I felt like I needed to cast more light on, I did. Like my telling of the Judgment of Paris, which I have a huge problem with. I don't think Athena and Hera would really care about who's the most beautiful. Aphrodite might, because that's her deal. But would like the queen of the gods and the warrior goddess really care? I don't think they would. So I kind of like, and I'm not alone in this. I, I emphasize it was more of a power struggle than a beauty contest. Um... I mean, Medusa's one I would love. She's not a goddess, but Medusa's one that I, like, I talked about Medusa the other day. If I would love to do, like, an, a long retelling of Medusa, like a book-length version where Medusa really gets to be the hero. Like, where we get to have her story. She's, she's in the Athena book, but she doesn't, ha she doesn't get to be the character of the agency. I would love to do a version where Medusa gets that. Oh, I know it would be a cool one. Totally pretty random character i came up with a really cool design for her she's only been in two panels i would love to do a book about or a story about echidna the mother of all monsters like that's what she's known for she's known for giving birth to like monstrous children and there's this weird element of a story that survived to us that maybe she was killed by argus the hundred-eyed watchman i want to like explore more about her and be like okay Maybe she's not the mother of all monsters. Maybe she's somebody who's like, I don't really like the way the Olympians are doing things. So I'm going to create a resistance. There's a lot of different ways to look at that. That's a great question. And it's one that I would love to um, explore more. There's a lot of tightnesses I'd love to cast a light on too. Basically, I mean, anytime there's a female character, you can almost always explore more. And I would love to do that sort of thing. Since the question was, if you could change any story about a goddess, what would it be? Do you feel like you already kind of did that with your version of Persephone? So, oh, okay, I guess I didn't really answer the question, because it was actually specifically if I could change it. And then um, Super Assistant Nicole followed up with, did I kind of already achieve that with my Persephone retelling? I don't know. That's a good question, because... Um, I'm careful in Olympians when I do make these changes to the story that I'm finding elements of the original myths that would support that. I don't like to make a, a wholesale change that I can't find at least one account that kind of supports it. So, you know, it'd be very nice to have like, um, like, like if I, if I wrote a story where like, like a really big change would be like, well, Persephone never gets kidnapped at all. She actually, I don't know, runs off herself. Like that would be such a big change. That would be very satisfying perhaps to read a version where she's like this, you know, teen runaway sort of thing and finds her own way. But I felt like that was too big a change. That's such a good question. I feel like I would like, I'm not going to do it good justice, just kind of rambling off the top of my head. That's the sort of thing you have to kind of read and let a story stew in your brain for a while. But that was great. Do you have a favorite Titan? Do I have a favorite Titan? Um, I mean, Atlas is pretty cool. 
Uh, Kronos, and he gets some good bits. He's kind of monstrous. Um, I kind of respect Oceanus of the original Titans. He's pretty cool in that he's just like, you know, you guys all want to go fight those Olympians. I'm just going to go, uh, I'm just going to be the ocean. See you later. That's pretty cool. I can respect that. And it takes some guts, too. He stands up to his brothers. Um, the other Titans, I think beyond those guys, there's not a lot of individual personification for me to latch on to. So, like, I would love to see more about, like, you know, there's, like, a lot of little personality elements you could kind of figure out from, like, little details, but there's not a lot of stories in the original canon that survives that kind of gives them much to shine. So I'm going to say, if I'm not counting Prometheus, because, I mean, he's the coolest, but if I'm, if I'm counting, like, only hulking huge titans, I'm going to go with Atlas. How did Perseus die? How did Perseus die? I, there's several different accounts for how Perseus eventually meets his end. Um, I think the one that's the most fun and the most ironic is a statue falls on him and kills him. Which, like, because, you know, he killed Medusa, so eventually that. I, <laughs> um, I mean, uh, super assistant Nicole just pumped her hands off stage because uh, she's a huge Medusa fan and hate... I don't think you could really hate Perseus for doing what the gods tell him to do. In fact, well, my depiction of Perseus very much shows that he is just kind of a dupe. He's just kind of like Hermes and Athena send him on to do his stuff. He's a little bit hapless. And I kind of like that take on him that he's, I feel like no other hero got so much as help as this guy. Like he's literally given like the flying shoes and the sword of Hermes. He's given the shield of Athena. In some versions of the story, in many versions of the story, he's given the helmet of Hades to turn invisible. They tell him every step of what to do. And I think I even say this in the book in the Geek Notes. I'm like, you tell me that I could probably have killed Medusa. Like he got so much help. So he's just kind of like he's like a straw man. He's like a fall guy. He's not a. And that's the other thing. What else does he do as a great hero? Yeah, he fights Cetus, but he's already holding the head of Medusa. He maybe kills Atlas, but he's holding the head of Medusa. He's a one. One trick pony. Um, since there are often very different versions of myths, how do you choose which ones you use? Since there are often very different versions, here's the question. <clears throat> there are often very different versions of the myths. How do I choose the ones I use? There's many different ways. For one thing, I actually go through because Olympians, I'm trying to make it be a uh, a cohesive story. You can read the books in any order, but I actually want them to all make sense on a timeline. I had to establish a timeline, and sometimes the myth that I choose is established by whether or not it makes sense in the timeline. I already mentioned the Atlas thing. I do not have Atlas being turned into stone by Perseus, A, because I don't think it would really happen. B, it doesn't make sense because he plays such an important part in the story of Heracles, the grandson of Perseus. So you can't have him kill him before he meets Heracles. Another instance, I go with the version of the birth of Hephaestus, where he is the son of both Zeus and Athena. Because in most versions of the story, the birth of Athena, when she's freed from Zeus's skull, it's Hephaestus who smacks open Zeus's head. There is this one vein of myth where it's actually Hephaestus isn't the son of Zeus. He's just the son of Hera. And she, I, I talked about this in his episode. She eats some lettuce, she slaps the ground, and then she gives birth to this weird, ugly baby. And it's very sexist and like, it's like, oh, you need a man to make a good baby. I mean, honestly, you need both sexes to make a baby. We know this, but like, I never liked that story either. But also it didn't make sense because then who frees Athena from Zeus's head? So that's one way. I kind of worked out a chronology. I have a big document at home worth this. Another way is I just choose the stories that I, I try to find the ones that have the most agency of the characters and the ones that make the most sense. And sometimes, and this is a lot, honestly, a lot of myths are kind of weak echoes of each other. Like you'll hear variations on the theme of the theme of the theme. I'll choose the one that is the best known or the most important, and then I just kind of ignore those other ones. We don't need to hear the 8 million stories about people who ran away from gods and were turned into stuff. We'll just do, you know, we're going to stick with the Apollo and Daphne one because that's clearly the big one, and we'll just skip the other stories. Do you feel that Amazons have the short end of the stick in Greek mythology? Well, okay, do I feel that the Amazons have the short end of the stick? I wish there was more stories about them. 
Um, they are, you know, they, they figure prominently in a few stories. Um, we like for, they're one of the labors of Heracles. He has to go fetch fetch the um, the girdle of Hippolyta. Um, they make little appearances here and there. Individual Amazons appear, but I would love like a really cool. And I, I feel like there probably was a story like this. A lot of the stories about females didn't get recorded. I would love a good origin story. I'd love a story that actually like is told from the point of view of like the Amazons as the heroes, or if not heroes, because heroes is a weighted term in Greek mythology, as the protagonists, like maybe a quest from an Amazon's point of view. The Amazons were sacred to Ares after all. And he's believed in some myths. He is the progenitor. Like, he's the father, which is interesting. Like, you know, you think of Wonder Woman. It's like, oh, isn't Ares the bad guy? Like, it kind of makes sense. They're the warlike. Well, there's two war gods in Olympus, and Athena doesn't have kids. So it makes sense that Ares would play a part because the Amazons were these ama this amazing warrior group of people, of women. So, yeah, I would. Uh, I don't think they get a short end of the stick, but I would love to see more about them. Do you think Odysseus is trash or a hero? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, what a, this must be coming from a classics professor. Do yes, I think? Baby Nets. Okay, do you think Odysseus is trash or a hero? So that's hilarious. Odysseus, all right. Like you know, there's the two big Homeric heroes. There's Achilles in the Iliad, and then there's Odysseus in the Odyssey. And they're very different. And like by modern sensibilities, I think we get very different takes on them. Like, I mean, some people really love Achilles. I read the Iliad, I'm like, Achilles is a big jerk. And okay, and Odysseus is a big jerk too, but he's he's a trickster jerk. And I, I've established over and over again, like the kind of smart character who gets by in their wits, I enjoy that character. Plus, Athena sticks up for him. And I gotta say, I mean, even though Athena, you know, she did she did Medusa wrong, but I feel like if Athena goes to bat for you as hard as she does for Odysseus, you gotta have something going on for you, right? Like he's de there's definitely things you it's hard to justify for Odysseus. He's um he's a very flawed hero, which makes him a super fascinating character. It's why he's so famous. So many millions, well not millions. Wow, it's getting into <laughs> di getting into dinosaur time. Um, so many thousands of years, like his story's been told. He's just well known. He's wily Odysseus, and he does stuff. You're sometimes like, oh Odysseus, you shouldn't have done that. But yeah, I think he's he's a pretty cool character. Follow up. Do you think Athena was subtly attracted to Odysseus, like you say Artemis was a little attracted to Orion? Do I think Athena was subtly attracted to Odysseus the way I show that uh, Artemis was attracted to Orion? I I think I talked about this somewhere before. There's, it's a tempting thought. There's a, there's much less evidence in the existing body of myths. There's a lot of stories where you see that Artemis is somewhat tempted. And there, I really can't point to anything beyond the Odysseus thing that maybe Athena was. I feel like Athena is very... Well, okay, Artemis made the decision. She's like, and because she, she has a terrible dad, and she saw what happened to her family's result. She's like, I'm not going to marry. I'm not going to have kids. That's it. And she decides that. And it was a very active will. So I think... There's some part of her that sometimes she's tempted by 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 lovers, male or female. It doesn't matter. She she it, it's not as turned off. I think Athena it is well and truly just not in her nature. I think she's like yeah, but there is that little bit of Odysseus that other writers have ha um latched onto. I think I've mentioned this book before, and I'll mention it again. Zachary Mason wrote this really great book called The Lost Books of the Odyssey, and it's like alternate takes on the odyssey the idea is like before the odyssey was codified before whoever wrote it down said this is the version of the odyssey when during all that period it was just oral stuff there was a version where yeah where athena tells odysseus her feelings and it's it's this chapter like each of the basically this book is like it's little chapters little short stories and there's a chapter where she does it and like there's this moment she just sees it in odysseus's face because she's a goddess and he looks at her and like even though she's professing her love for him it, it diminishes her in his eyes because he's only a person and she's an olympian and she of course sees that the second it happens and then something horrible happens to odysseus in that version so the person who thinks odysseus is trash 
You'll enjoy that book. <laughs> Did Athena ever get pregnant? Um, no. Uh, not in the Greek myths. Did Athena ever get pregnant? Um, Rick Riordan kind of came up with a clever workaround with that. So, you know, in the Rick Riordan stories, uh, it's all about the demigods, the modern gods today. And one of the things that's kind of a bummer about that, if you're working from, if you're Rick Riordan, right? Um, a lot of those gods, goddesses don't have kids. There's Hestia, there's Artemis, there's Athena. And if you want to create like a whole new generation of, um, like demigods, you're losing like a big chunk of the pantheon. So he kind of comes up with the idea that she creates head babies because she was a head baby. I don't know if he calls her head babies, but she's able to birth them out of her skull. I, I haven't read all his books, so maybe he gets more specific about it. That kind of works. But I like the idea, like, my my Athena, she's one of those people, like, we all know the person who's afraid to even touch a baby. She's like, ew, they're weird and soft, and they got that weird spot in their head. No, thank you. She just does I don't think Athena has any interest in kids at all. That's my take, and I, I have to say, it's I think it's supported by the myth, mythological record. Do you think Athena has any history with the Amazons? Do I think Athena has any history with the Amazons? Huh. That's an interesting question because, like I said, there is definitely the very tangible connection between Ares and the Amazons. And if I may delve into what I think, the Amazons represented a wild warrior culture that operated outside the Greek world to the Greeks. And I think there was a certain amount of fear attached to them. And so I feel like one of the reasons, besides the fact that she's not really the childbirthing type, that Ares was ascribed to them is because I think they were viewed as somewhat savage and lesser than the Greeks, even though they were these ferocious warriors. And that's just not a great attitude. But I think Athena, who is so near and dear to like, well, specifically the Athenian way of the Greek world, but she was like, she represented civilization and stuff to them. I feel like even though it would make all the sense in the world for the warrior goddess to be the patron of the goddess, I mean, of the warrior women, I don't think, I could be wrong. There might be someone out there who's an expert in Amazons that could say there's an instance, but I feel like that falls outside of what they normally ascribe to the Amazons. These are really good questions today. Yeah, but the last question. This is the last question. Again, thank you all for tuning in. I'm sorry it was late. Uh, let me just quick, oh, I'll add that afterwards, yeah. Um, is, as the son of Hermes, is Pan considered a god? As the son of Hermes, is Pan considered a god? Yes. In fact, one of his, there's a very famous epithet attached to him where he is called the great god uh, Pan, um, which great god is a term, you know, there's normally the Olympians and then some gods are ascribed, like Hades is normally called a great god because he's not really Olympian. Pan isn't really an Olympian, but there is weirdly, there is, he's got another unique position. There is a story, comes from late antiquity, where Pan is maybe a god who died. There was this guy, I think his name was Sodon. It's a little bit, of, it's weird because it's a little bit of a historical thing. There was a battle and there was a soldier named Sodon who was traveling across the water when he heard a voice say, the great god Pan is dead. And like, it was reported as like historical fact back in the day. Which it's such a fascinating story. I should that's something when I, I when I revisit Pan, I want to talk about this. I didn't put it in the books. So if Pan truly did die, if a voice from beyond truly did announce he died, I guess that makes him more of like a demigod, right? Because he 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 shouldn't be able to pass away, and that's interesting because his father is Hermes, an Olympian. His mother is Penelope, but not the Penelope that's with Odysseus, although sometimes it is, but she's normally set, thought to be a separate uh, nymph. So maybe, because Hermes, he's already like, his mom was the daughter of Atlas, so he's got a little bit of Titan in him, he's got Zeus. Maybe like somehow it got diluted enough that Pan could die, or maybe, I read a, I read a story, which I'm not gonna remember the name of it, I read a story that was very clever. It was just like, yeah, he's Pan. Why would you listen to Pan? His dad's the trickster god. He's a bit of a trickster too. Like he said that. I don't know. Pan is a god, but what level? He's certainly not Olympian, but he's something up there. So wrapping this up, uh, thank you all for tuning in. I apologize this went, uh, started a little bit late today. I'm so pleased you joined me anyway. Um, tomorrow, I'm not going to be doing my normal Geek Speaks Greek. 
What I'm going to be doing instead, instead of seeing me here at the George O'Connor, go to Word Bookstores. I'm going to be talking with my good friend Ian Lendler. He wrote a book called The First Dinosaur. It's about how humanity discovered dinosaurs. It's like the period, like there was a time where we didn't know dinosaurs were real and suddenly they started finding these giant bones and they assembled them into these crazy shapes. And we're, he's going to be talking about this book and I'm going to be kind of there on a split screen with him, like live drawing. I'm going to be drawing dinosaurs. The only thing in the world I love maybe as much as Greek myths. So we're going to be doing that at the Word Bookstores. Like, so go to at Word Bookstores. I'll be posting stuff here to remind you. That's going to be at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And that's just going to be a one-day thing. I'm just going to be there. Ian's going to be taking over some stuff, working on the Word uh, store after that, talking about other books with other artists. Meet me back here Thursday, where I'm going to be continuing my normal standard. I'm not just going to be relying on you guys to come up with great questions and answers, even though you guys have been doing an amazing job. You gave me enough ideas for like another like 12 episodes today alone. I'm going to – I have a few ideas what the lecture is going to be Thursday. I'll be posting on my Instagram. I'll be here lecturing, drawing, and I hope to see you all then. Thank you all so much for tuning in, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.